We welcome you once again to our discussions of the scriptures of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Today we're continuing our discussion of the Book of Mormon. I'm Professor Terry Ball from the Department of Ancient Scripture at Brigham Young University, and joining me today are three of my colleagues. Seated next to me is Professor Gay Strathern. So glad to have you with us, Gay. Thank you. Also joining us today is Professor Paul Hoskison. Good to have you with us as always, Paul. Good to be here. And a third member of our discussion today is Professor Clyde Williams. Good to have you with us, Clyde. All right, we're going to begin with chapter eight of the Book of Mormon in our discussion today. The setting, Laman and Lemuel and Nephi have returned with Zoram and uh, and Ishmael's family, and they're they're I, they're all together in the valley of uh, Lemuel by the river Laman. Um, and God decides while they're there to give them some instruction and does it with a wonderful vision. Just before having the vision, Nephi makes this observation in his record, and it came to pass that we had gathered together all manner of seeds of every kind, both of grain of every kind and also of seeds of fruit of every kind. They left their gold and their silver and everything else back home, but not the seeds. They're going to need that. When they get to the promised land, they're going to have to uh, sustain themselves somehow, and it's going to be a lot easier, at least initially, to use and raise crops that they're familiar with. Eventually they'll shift over if you carefully plot it out through the book to, to uh, vegetation that's indigenous to the, to the new promised land as well. And then uh, we find Lehi coming forth and saying, Behold, I have dreamed a dream. That's an interesting way to say it. We'd say, I had a dream. Uh, what's the significance of saying, I dreamed a dream? Well, this is one of those Hebrew phrases that we've talked about in some of the other episodes. Uh, this one has cognate a technical, right? yeah, a technical right. term is a cognate accusative, where the verb and the object of the verb are, are the same word, really. Once uh, and and so you say a dream, a dream. This is very popular in all Semitic writing, both in in uh, Hebrew and in Babylonian and in Arabic too, but it's not very well liked in English. I think English teachers would mark you down for using a cognate accusative like this. There's a lot of it in the Book of Mormon uh, uh, throughout these sections. So it's good evidence that really, in spite of the fact that we have an abridgment and a translation into English, some of these artifacts or relics of the, of the original language still creep into the text and testify that it really is what Joseph Smith taught us it was, a translation from a record kept by people from with ancient Near Eastern origins. So, Laman calls, or excuse me, Lehi calls his family together, tells them he's so worried about Laman and Lemuel because of this vision, and then he tells them about the vision. Perhaps let, me, let me make a comment here about the language, too. We, we have mentioned these Hebraisms and, and, uh, and things from Semitic languages in the text, but in verse 4, we actually have something that's strictly English, has no counterpart in any ancient language. That's the word methought. Mm -hmm. uh, which tells you again that Joseph is really reaching for his vocabulary because methought is a really ancient phrase in English. It stops being a live part of the language long before the King James Bible. Uh, you see it in Chaucer and some of the Middle English writers. Uh, but it persists in English as a frozen form, and, and people don't understand what it means. And people sometimes read this passage and say, oh, that's just bad grammar. No, this is really good older English. It occurs twice in the Book of Mormon, and I don't think it ever occurs in the King James Bible. So Joseph is reaching deep in, into vocabulary to produce this text. So he's translating it, he comes across this, this term, and this is the best term he knows of to, to translate whatever it was that was written on the plates. It's methought. a little bit like the, the Greek middle voice. I don't want to be too technical here, but there's nothing like that in any of the Semitic languages. This is purely English that's coming through here. Interesting, very interesting. Maybe we ought to quickly just kind of summarize uh, what Lehi saw in the vision. Clyde, do you want to give us a, a Reader's Digest condensed version of the, of the vision? Well, of course, he's uh, going to be involved here with uh, walking through a dreary waste and, and uh, the experience of uh, going through the world uh, and for many hours, perhaps uh, reflective of the temptations of the world, as President Benson suggested, and then he's going to uh, see the tree and in a distance, and he'll see the river of water, and he'll see the uh, rod of iron, and the path, and the spacious building, and the mists of darkness, and uh, and he'll see uh, all of these symbols that have meaning and importance, and uh, 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 that that really becomes a uh, foundation upon any time, any period, not just Lehi's day, that you could plug yourself, ourselves, into this dream and, and ask ourselves, so where am I in the midst of all of this symbolism that he sees? 
he doesn't spend a lot of time interpreting it for his, his sons, which is obvious because Nephi is going to have to pray to, and get his own revelation to understand it. But um, what do you suppose Lehi was really hoping Laman and Lemuel and, and, and that we would get out of his telling of this vision? I think it's important to get some of the, the, uh, the main points and the, and the structure of this down a little bit. He begins it at the end of verse 4 by saying, I saw in my dream a dark and dreary wilderness. This is setting the stage for the whole thing because it opens up as a dark and dreary wilderness. But, uh, but before all of that, he, um, uh, he, he passes into the dark and dreary wilderness. Uh, a man comes to him in a white robe and says, follow me. And as he follows him, he finds himself in that dark and dreary waste, as it says at the end of seven. But the man's no longer there. And he's now, there for he, many hours, isn't and, he? And he's there for a long time in verse eight. And, and the only way to get out of this darkness is to pray. And that's gonna be a really significant uh, uh, teaching that, that uh, Lehi wants to get across. And I suspect that Laman and Lemuel were supposed to get the message. I, we don't know if they ever did, but if you're in darkness, you got to pray. That's the only way to get out. And when he prays, then he realizes in verse 9 that he's in this large and spacious field. Uh, this probably represents mortality. He's passed into the dark and dreary waste, mortality, and he can't see very well. He prays, and now he can begin to see the bigger picture of the spacious field. And he sees the tree now. And he sees the fruit and goes there and partakes of it. Later on, of course, we'll learn what that is when we get over to the later sections where Nephi has his vision. And then he wants, because it's so wonderful, he wants his family to partake. So he looks around and from the tree, he can see the family. First, of course, he sees uh, Nephi and Sam and his wife and beckons them to come and they do. And then he sees Laman and Lemuel and they're way, way off, way off in the field and, and they're not coming. And then he notices in, in uh, chapter tw uh, in verse 20, um, in 19, the rod of iron and the straight path, and they all lead away from, the, that is, they're, they're, it's going away from the tree. And he looks way out there beyond all of that, beyond the fountain, and he sees a large and spacious field as if it had been a world. So this is a different large and spacious place than the one that he found himself in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, where he'd been conducted to by the man in white. And what he sees there are a lot of people trying to get from that place, which is like a world, to the spacious field that he had traversed to get to the tree. And along the way, um, and, they, and they want to get a hold of the rod, they want to take the path, and along the way uh, arose a mist of darkness in 23, so they can't see where they're going. The only way you're going to get to the tree is to grab a hold of the rod, follow the path. And then some That's people make it. That's a message for Laman and Lemuel too. It's a la message for Laman and Lemuel. And some people grab the rod, some hang on, some don't, some make it to the tree, some make it to the tree and fall away, some make it to the tree and stay. And some people never get the rod. They're out wandering in the, in the midst of darkness. They never pray, they never get out of darkness. And then of course, some of them make it to the spacious building in verse 26. And we learn later on what that represents uh, about the world. But I think there's a, there's a bottom line message here about us too how we fit into this dream of the world and the preexistence and how we're trying to get to the tree. And, and I've heard Clyde talk about this, so I want to hear him say it again. What, what, what are the, the, these people that make it, some make it to the tree and some don't, and some fall away? And Well, you know, it seems to me we look at, there's four groups of people that we can find here, at least as I see four groups, and, and it's also important to recognize that those four groups match up perfectly, it seems to me, with the parable of the sower and the four types of soil. And so you outline, as you go through here, these groups of people and how they match up with those four types of soil. But in, of particular interest to, to me, and we can come back and look at some of the other specifics, is the two groups that come to the tree. And, and I see here parallel language in each of these cases. That is to say, those who come towards the tree are going to be pressing forward. And when they, and when they commence the path, either they immediately catch hold of the end of the rod of the iron, or they don't get hold of it. And, and then, so in other words, you begin to see differences. So like in verse 21 and 22, where we have these people pressing forward, and they come and they commence the path, I stop and I ask my students, now, any problems with this group? And usually they say, no, I don't have any problems. And I tell them, if I'm the theme park ranger here at the Tree of Life theme park, I've got serious concerns. And I'm hollering something. I'm hollering to them to get hold of the rod. And of course, you read the next verse, and the mist of darkness arise. They didn't have hold of the rod, and so they fall away. Well, now that's pretty clear. But we come then to verse 24 and 25, and we have here the group that does the same thing, press forward. In this case, they catch hold of the end of the rod of iron, and they press through the mist of darkness, clinging to the rod. 
and then they partake of the fruit and are ashamed. And, and my question was to myself as a young seminary teacher when I first taught this was, all right, so that's this group. We come down here and we look at verse 30, the other group who presses forward, catches hold of the end of the rod, pressing their way forward, continually holding fast. They fell down, partook of the fruit, and don't fall away. That is to say, the end of verse uh, 33, when the mocking comes, they heeded them not. And I, I began to wonder why the difference. And I thought, all of us, Latter-day Saints, uh, we're, we're coming to the tree. Uh, at, at least that's our understanding, surely. So the question is, how do I know if I'm one who's going to fall away or not? And it seems to me there are three different reasons, three different things that are happening here. The first is how you hold the rod. Uh, clinging versus continually holding fast. Clinging must here imply, and Elder Bednar spoke about this uh, uh, some while back, and, and it, it's just a matter of perhaps holding like with your fingers in this manner, rather than gripping hold with all your might. You might have a longing to look off to, and maybe participate, but take of something on the side here, but don't quite let go. But it, it's, it's just not in your heart. Maybe you take the sacrament, but not with much intense uh, feeling or with uh, genuine uh, attitude. So it's a little bit like the phrase that, you know, you're supposed to feast on the words of Christ until the end instead of nibble on yes, the words of Christ. not snack, nibble, or pick at it. Yes. That's right. Exactly. That's Gorge what you're yourself. doing. That's, you're, you're, so not, you're not feasting. Clinging is not enough. Yeah. And, and then the second difference is when they get to the tree, this other group that's continually holding fast falls down. I think not from exhaustion, but they fall down because they recognize the value of what they have now received at the tree and whose presence they're in because the tree ultimately represents Christ, as Nephi will show to us clearly in chapters 10 and 11. And, uh, and then, of course, the third, which is the obvious difference, when the mocking and the persecution or the trial comes, the ones who were just kind of taking it, but taking it for granted, taking it casually, they fall away. And the others who, who it meant more, and they understood the value of the atonement and the precious fruit they were receiving, they heed them not because yeah, they, they know what really is important. So I, to I me, love that phrase, you know, they he, we, we heeded them not. I think there's a great lesson there for us. We're yeah. all in, in the world, there's always difficulties. There's always going to be people who are trying to pull us in different directions. But when you are focused on the Saviour, on His atonement, as this group is, then then that becomes a sidelight and it's, it becomes much more easy to not worry about what they're thinking or what they're doing. We heeded them not. I think that's just a powerful, powerful statement telling us yeah. about Lee high and Nephi and his family. Yeah. Boy, Can you say some more about the four soils and how this ties in? Because it seems to me the last group you just talked about, that's the good soil that, that grows and produces a lot of fruit. Well, and, and then you would say the, 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 the second one that you talked the, the Matthew In Matthew chapter 13, if we look at those, those four soils and, yeah. we, and we speak of those, and I'm going to just turn here quickly. In Matthew chapter 13, we've got those four types of soil. And, and just to, not to belabor this, but we have in the case of the, uh, the seed by the, well, let's do, I'll just take them in the order. In verse 4 of Matthew 13, we've got the seed by the wayside. And, and, uh, and this is, the, this is the, uh, the, the people who are making a beeline for the spacious building. It never gets any root whatsoever. Uh, in fact, in, in the parable of the sower, if you thought it was going to get root, it's a trampled and dusty part of the wayside, but the, the birds also or the fowls come and pluck up that seed before it ever gets root. Those folks out there who never even come towards the path, they're the ones making the beeline for the spacious building. And so it fits that group. The second one we'd speak about here would be uh, the seed in the stony places where the where the ground is stony, it does get root. In the early spring, when you plant uh, seeds in stony ground and in fertile soil, in the early spring, you couldn't tell the difference. It's when the heat comes and you get the heat of summer, the ones that don't have depth of root, you see, or in the stony soil here, they don't have depth of root, it withers. And so this is the people who are clinging to the rod. They don't have the depth of root, you see, to really hold them in the tough. They're okay when things are going well, but let there be a big trial or test and they wither away and die or they fall away and are overcome by the mist of darkness. And the third one would be the thorns here. And the thorns we learn here in the uh, uh, parable of the sower, that's in verse 7, also are told by the Savior to be the cares of the world. This is the people who are coming along but not getting hold of the rod of iron. They're overcome by the mist of darkness or the temptations of the devil, and they fall away. Are, and, these, the ones, are these the ones that, that uh, they're ashamed yeah. When 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 they get to the tree, they're ashamed of it, and so they, I would say the cares I would the no, I would say that one personally goes with the ones in stony place. In other words, they don't have the depth of root, and thus when the when the people mock, okay. they don't have deep root, and they're they're embarrassed and they're ashamed. And the other, of course, the thorns, because it parallels with the cares of the world or temptations of the devil. 
that's the ones who aren't clinging to the rod. That's the ones back in 1 Nephi 8 here, verse 21 and 22. And then, of course, the obvious one, the good ground, is the ones who come, continue holding fast, and remain faithful. And, and the thing that's interesting to me is these two uh, literary uh, representations are really from the same source, from the Lord. He's just used two different complete parallel, and yet he's taught the same principle. Same and, and you're principle. saying, and Joseph Smith made this up? I don't <laughs> think so. Not possible. And the invitation to us, and obviously from Lehi to his sons, is to look at the the different groups, the different soils, and ask, where am I? Where do I want to be? Yeah. And what do I need to do differently yeah. to get where I'm supposed to be? Yeah. You read it there back in the chapter 8 that after explaining the vision, uh, verse 37, that Lehi did exhort them, meaning Laban and Lemuel, with all the, all, of, with the, all the feeling of a tender parent. Well, if you're a parent, you identify with that, the pleading, the anxiety he must have felt from this vision. He knew what's from the Lord and wondering what's going to happen happen to his boys. He, he believes there's a chance for him. And there, there obviously is at this time. He and wants think, them to come, yes. I think this is a tie back though, to that chapter one where we're talking about the tender mercies of the Lord. Mm -hmm. On the big scale, that's what the Book of Mormon is teaching. It's wanting us to learn that. And here we see Lehi in a type, I think, of the father working with his children and also having the tender mercy. So we kind of see a microcosm of the big uh, picture that the Book of Mormon's trying to teach us. It's kind of like, here's, here's back in chapter 1 again in First Nephi, I'll, I'll, I'll show you deliver, a way to be delivered, and here's Jerusalem going to be destroyed. And here's, well, now you can be delivered from Jerusalem. Now here we see this for the whole representation of the world, and you can be delivered. You don't have to be overcome by these things. And he sees it, and now he's trying to, as he was trying to warn the people in Jerusalem, he's trying to tell his own family. He's trying to, in a way, tell us, as the Lord has preserved it for us, the same thing. We don't have to be destroyed. We don't have to end up in the river of water. We don't have to end up in the midst of darkness. We don't have to end up in a spacious building. But we're going to have to come, you see, to Christ and come to, uh, to partake of the fruit and, and use the word to do it. I, I don't want to leave this without saying one more thing about the dream itself in here and some of the things that I think it's teaching. Uh, in the beginning, when Lehi's in darkness, he prays to get out. And I think that's one of the key things in this whole thing. If you want to get out of spiritual darkness and then you've lost your way in the world, you got to pray. That's the key to getting out of it. I think the other thing that, that uh, to me is striking is that once he's partaken of the fruit now, he can see things the rest of us can't see. The people in the midst of darkness can't see out of those mists of darkness, mm -hmm. but Lehi can see them and he can see where they're going and he can see things that the rest of the world cannot see. And to me, this is a call to, to pay attention to the prophet because he can see things that we don't see. Excellent. Good point. We really aren't told how much Laman and Lemuel really understood what they did after hearing this. We do know what Nephi does, and that's outlined for us in chapter 10. Chapter 9 is just kind of a, another little editorial note where Nephi says, Listen up, reader. I've just finished abridging things from my father's book. Sometimes we call it the Book of Lehi, right? And now I'm going to... Uh, give accounts of my, of, my, of my own accounting in what follows in, in, in the verses that, that come next. And so he then proceeds to tell us what, um, what, what he experienced. Um, I think that this is chapter 10 is very important to kind of give us some background of, of how Lehi's coming to this vision. We've mm -hmm. taught many instances that uh, the pondering of scripture can open up revelation for us. And I think that there's some little keys in the text to suggest that one of the catalysts for Lehi receiving this vision is that he had been searching the scriptures. We notice back in chapter five where they get the plates and um, they come back. What's one of the first things that they do? Verse 10. And he did search them from the very beginning. And then that's repeated up in verse 21. Um, and searched them and found that they were desirable. I, th I think that what the catalyst for this vision is that he's been searching the plates. But I think there's some keys here to help us understand even more what they, what they were, um, Lehi was studying. Um, notice if we go over to verses, uh, let's see, 12 and on. In chapter 10. In chapter 10. 
Um, yea, even my father spake much concerning the Gentiles and also concerning the house of Israel, that they should be compared unto an olive tree whose branches should be broken off and should be scattered upon all of the face of the earth. Where do we get that language from the brass plates? It's from Zenus's allegory, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And I think that there's the fact that we have Lehi is seeing a vision of a tree, which is clearly the tree of life, and we're having Zenus's allegory of a tree and all of the things going in there. I wonder whether that's what he's thinking about in terms of... Um, the covenant Israel being scattered. How's that going to affect him? How's it going to affect his family? And those kind of pondering questions then become the catalyst for this this vision. Beautiful. And, and uh, uh, leading up to that, you mentioned that, that he's probably reading the, the allegory there and bringing up some elements of it here because he's probably read it on the brass plates. Also, there in chapter 10, verse, after he's talked about the destruction, now that uh, after they leave to Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem is not destroyed for a, a few years afterwards. So <laughs> when he talks about Jerusalem being destroyed in, in chapter 10, verse 3, it's, it, he's seen it in a, a, a vision. That is, it's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. But one of the things that makes Lehi rejoice in all of this is uh, the thing that he mentions in verse 4, that is, that the Lord's going to raise up a prophet among them, like unto Moses himself. This is a paraphrase here of, of Deuteronomy 18, uh -huh. 15 through 19. So he's not only bringing in the allegory of the olive tree, he's bringing in Deuteronomy, and then in verse 8, he's paraphrasing Isaiah 40, verse 3, again, talking about what the, the, the John the Baptist and what he's going to perform for the Lord. So it, uh, right now, Lehi's uh, has read the plates, he's digested them, if he hadn't already done that before he got the, the, the other set of plates. Uh, and Nephi is trying to present all of this uh, material to us so that we understand the context of what's going on. The vision that must have uh, come from the springboard of reading the scriptures must have been pretty detailed. When you look at the detail that's given as he kind of goes through the history of what's going to happen. So in, in chapter, in verse 3 rather of chapter 10, we have him explaining clearly of the Babylonian captivity and then the return from the Babylonian captivity. And then we have the birth of the Messiah in, in verse 4. And then we hear the, we see the ministry of John the Baptist right down to some of what he speaks uh, in verse 8. And, and where he He's going to baptize in Beth Barah. That's not in Isaiah. No. He must have seen this happening and recognized this is the place. He, well, I know that place. He's baptizing in, in, in Beth Barah. And then the witness of the, of the Holy Spirit when Christ is baptized. And then the crucifixion of Christ. And then the resurrection of Christ. And then his people, we're on, down to verse 13, coming to the new world. And then the dispensation of the Gentiles, who he understands clearly are going to be the stewards of the covenants in the latter days with the responsibility of gathering scattered Israel. This, this vision must have been sweeping and incredible detailed as he lays it out. And this is just an introduction to how Nephi is now going to take in chapter 12 and 13 and 14 and explain it in even greater detail. Um, well, it's so powerful what Lehi is teaching us that Nephi, is, it's not enough for him to just hear his dad's explanation of this. So he comes down and, and says in verse 17, that I, Nephi, was desirous also that I might see and hear and know of these things by the power of the Holy Ghost. So as important as it was to hear his dad saying this and teaching it and teaching what the dream meant, Nephi had this burning within him that he needed to have his testimony of it. He needed to see it and to, to have his own personal experience with this from which he could go on. Um, and then when he says in verse 19, he that diligently seeketh shall find the mysteries of God shall be unfolded. Given the context here, I think the mystery here for him is, I want to know the things that my dad had seen as well. And I think that's one of the central messages at the beginning of the Book of Mormon here. That is that uh, Lehi is clearly the prophet of this family. He's the leader of the family. He has visions. He has revelations. And uh, normally, for most people in the world, that would be enough. But what the Book of Mormon is teaching is that you also have the right to receive visions and revelations from the Lord. And Nephi is the best example of that. When his father has a vision back in chapter 1, Nephi wants to have it. When his father has a vision of the tree of life, Nephi wants to know it. When, uh, when his father talks about the life of the Savior, you just so well, uh, outlined so well here in this chapter, Nephi wants to get it. He wants to have the same thing. He wants that spiritual revelation. And, and that really is one of the essences of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's outlined so well here right at the beginning of the Book of Mormon. 
you think Lane and Lemuel could have had that experience too? Absolutely. <laughs> they didn't yeah. want it, but they could have. Yeah. Even the, even the yeah. Lehman Lemuels in our own families yeah. could yeah. have that well, experience. Chapter 15, Nephi says, when they're arguing about what their dad said, well, have you asked? No. Well, why not? He makes no such thing known unto us. Yeah. That's only because they haven't asked. That's and right. Nephi has learnt that throughout his time here, that if you ask, God will respond to you. Very good. So, when you're finished with all this, Clyde, what do you what's what's the take home message of these verses of these chapters eight through ten? Well, you know, I think here in chapter ten, verse eighteen, speaking of God, He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and the way is prepared for all men from the foundation of the world. If it so be that they repent and come unto Him, that in a sense really is the theme here. And, and when we go back to chapter 9 and we find this statement that God knows all things, this is verse 6, from the beginning, and prepareth a way to accomplish all his works, he's showing Nephi and all who are willing that this is indeed the case. And so this tree of life experience that, uh, that's presented here is, uh, is so profound. It becomes the foundation, it seems to me, that uh, not only Lehi builds on, but Nephi will build upon. And even though he doesn't specifically mention the details of the dream after uh, chapter 10 through uh, 14, he'll come back to what happens to people. And it all fits into this perspective. It's what do we do with the scriptures? What do we do with the word of God? It will make all the difference to us in our lives, in our homes, in our families, and in our society. Uh, what do we do with Christ? That's gonna be the whole story of the rest of the Book of Mormon. And that's the tree. Do I come to Christ? What do I think of and how do I approach and feel about the atonement? That's the message that's here. And if I take it and I use that and, and I make it a vital part of my life, then I'm going to have that which is sweet above all that's sweet. It'll be, a, it'll be a wonderful life, even though there still will be challenges as Nephi could surely bear witness and his brother Jacob and others will bear witness to us. I think it's just a, 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 a wonderful uh, analogy for us to see and to, to learn from. And, that's what's important to me. Thank you.